AP Biology, Chapter 42, Part 4. Blood pressure and osmotic pressure. All right, exchange across the capillary walls. It's simple diffusion, high to low concentration. Blood pressure within the capillary water walls push the fluid. And this is a review of the end of uh, Part 3 in the previous uh, podcast. For bigger molecules to get them inside the cells, we use endocytosis and exocytosis, uh, exocytosis leaving the cell. And the blood cells, as well as proteins, are too big to leave the capillaries, so they stay in the capillaries. Lymphatic system, let's write this down. Parallel circulatory system, it's a secondary system of tubes returning fluid, interstitial fluid, back to your circulatory system. It's also for transporting white blood cells. WBC stands for white blood cells, and they're the cops of your body. They defend against infection. That we'll learn about more in detail in a different chapter. Interstitial fluid uh, mainly comes back to the circulatory system via the higher osmotic pressure on the vein side. However, about 15% uh, still needs to be returned back to the circulatory system, and that's also the job of the lymphatic system. These uh, tubes, which also have one-way valves like your veins, uh, every time you flex your muscle, you push that fluid, interstitial fluid, back to um, the vena cava at the right atrium. You're going to be returning it to where the um, uh, inferior in vena cava reaches that right atrium. As you can see right over here, we have the lymph vessels taking that interstitial fluid back here to the vena cava to return that fluid back to your circulatory system. Now, another thing you should know is that this is how fats are transported to your circulatory system. Remember, fats that uh, are broken down during digestion don't enter your circulatory system right away. They first have to enter the lymphatic system, and then the lymphatic system takes the fats to the circulatory system to deliver them to the cells of the body. Control of the heart. Timely delivery of oxygen to the body's organs is critical. The mechanisms evolved to assure the continuity and control of the heartbeat um, is going to be important for making sure that heart doesn't uh, miss a beat. And we have something to do that. It's called a pacemaker. Now, you might have heard of a pacemaker with like medical technology, but your heart has its own pacemaker, and you only need a man-made one is to, if your uh, natural one doesn't function properly. Now, one thing you should know about this is that the pacemaker is also called the SA node. And the reason why it's called that is it's on the uh, atria of the uh, right atrium. So let's go ahead and write that down. Pacemaker, also called the SA node, synchronizes the contraction of the heart located on the right atrium. And you do have to know that the pacemaker of your heart is located on the right atrium. Over here, we have the pacemaker on the right atrium. It sends out an electrical, electrochemical signal down the right atrium that triggers the cardiac muscle to contract. So here we have contraction of the cardiac muscle of the atria, dumping the blood into the ventricles. Then something interesting happens. That electrical signal, represented by yellow, travels through the middle point called the uh, AV node. And this AV node between the atria and ventricle will just pause the the electrical signal down just a little bit to give the atria time to dump their blood. Then the signal continues to the bottom of the heart. Once the signal reaches the bottom here, it's going to increase in strength as far as an electrical signal back up the ventricles, increased by the Purkinje fibers, and cause a big contraction of these ventricles to pump that blood into the arteries. So over here, we have an ECG, or electrocardiogram, and that uh, you've seen these on probably hospital movies and shows and things like that. Beep, beep, beep. So the first part here is the electrical activity coming off the SA node, also called the pacemaker, originating the electrical signal. Then as it travels down this, um, the atria, the electrical signal activity drops off. Then once it reaches the AV node, there's a slight pause right there as it reaches the bottom. And then once the electrical signal reaches the bottom, big electrical impulse caused by Purkinje fibers, as you can see with the spike, causing a, a big contraction of the heart muscle uh, ventricles. And then there's a relaxation phase a little bit over here. Now, as you can imagine, if they're looking at one of these, if you have a low 
starting, uh, you know, second part, there's probably something wrong with the bottom of the heart as far as conducting electrical impulses. If there is a, um, so you can analyze where the problem is depending on what part of the ECG is, uh, is not normal. ECG and EKG mean the same thing. They both mean cardiogram. All right, coordinated contraction. So the SA node generates electrical impulse, as we talked about earlier, and uh, the impulse is going to be delayed by the AV node in the middle, right over here, right in the middle, AV node. It gives the uh, ventricles a chance to uh, fill up. And then the uh, signal goes to the bottom of the heart and then contracts the ventricles, and that's what you need to know. You don't have to know that point one second part. All right, so physiologic uh, cues affect the heart rate. So you've probably seen a scary movie or been shocked or startled or something, and you felt your heart speed up. That's your nervous system. Your nervous system is uh, uh, in control of your heart to some degree. You can speed up that pacemaker, the SA node, slow it down. And two different sets of nerves will um, either slow down the pacemaker or speed it up. One set slows it uh, down, one set speeds it up. Hormones like epinephrine, also called adrenaline, released from the adrenaline gland, will increase the heart rate, like when you see a scary movie. Uh, body temperature, uh, if your body temperature um, starts to go too uh, low, that will uh, slow down your heart. Exercise speeds it up. Blood and blood cells, okay, so what is blood? Blood is a mixture of fluid and cells, a liquid part and a cell part. The liquid part, called plasma, makes up about 55% of the volume, and the cells uh, make up about 45%. And we do need to write this down. The plasma has ions, electrolytes, plasma proteins, nutrients, waste products, ooh, that's important, gases, hormones, delivered uh, by the, the plasma. Cells, uh, the three major types of cells in uh, the blood are the red blood cells, called RBCs, also called erythrocytes. Site means cell, erythro means red, so that literally means red cell. These are the transporting gas cells, and they're located right here. We have white blood cells called leukocytes. They are used for defense. Leuco means white in, I believe, Latin. And then there's platelets, which are like pieces of cells that are involved with blood clotting. So th we're going to go into a little more detail on this, but this is a general overview of blood. All right, so here's some more details, and you don't have to know these details at this point. You definitely need to know this stuff here, but this you do not, you do not have to write down or know. All right, so what we have is plasma and cell components. These are all the things in plasma. And again, just know this top stuff. Over here, the cellular components, we have the red blood cells. You got about five to six million per microliter. That's a lot of red blood cells. We have five different types of white blood cells that we'll talk about in uh, the immune system chapters. And then we have platelets, which are parts of cells that involve with like blood clotting. Think of it as like twigs like, along a uh, river, kind of catching on uh, edges of, um, of rocks and stuff plugging up but they uh, cut. Now all your red and white blood cells come from stem cells. Stem cells can become any kind of cell and you should know that all the blood cells come from the stem cells in your bone marrow. So let's write that down. Bone marrow, stem cells, makes all the blood cells, white and red blood cells. Now as far as writing down all these you don't have to do that but make sure that you know that the cells in your blood are made from stem cells in your bone marrow. Now they'll specialize in different places. Uh, T cells specialize in a different place than B cells, but we're not going to get into details on that yet. Red blood cells transport oxygen. They're small, biconcave disc. Concave means like a cave on the inside. Both sides have it, so it's biconcave. There's a large surface area function, uh, delivery of oxygen structure, a lot of surface area to move that oxygen. Produced in the marrow of your long bones. Uh, write this down for red blood cells. Lac nuclei and mitochondria. Oxygen transport, small bi biconcave disc. You should be generally familiar with the large surface area because of that concave. And they don't have nuclei or mitochondria. And they don't live very long. They only last about three to four months. Without nuclei, you have more space for uh, transporting uh, oxygen via hemoglobin. And the ATP is only made by glycolysis, or anaerobic respiration, which doesn't make a lot of ATP. If you remember, glycolysis only makes two. Once uh, the blood cells are broken down, they're ingested by white blood cells, phagocytic cells, in the liver and spleen, and then, the, um, then they're destroyed. So three million red blood cells destroyed each section, second, but you're also making that many as well. So 
That's a good thing. All right, five to six million red blood cells in one microliter of human blood. There's about five liters of blood in your whole body, and you should know that there's about five liters of blood in your body. You don't have to know about this part. Uh, this is important, though. Make sure you have this down. Each red blood cell has 250,000, a quarter of a million, hemoglobin molecules, and each hemoglobin can carry four oxygen. So that means each red blood cell can carry one million oxygen molecules. That's a lot for each one of the five to six million red blood cells in a microliter of human blood. Here's hemoglobin. Remember, there's a quarter of a million of these in each red blood cell. And this is a protein, a quaternary structure, fourth uh, degree structure. And in the center here, we have iron. Iron helps this thing fold. Remember, iron's a cofactor. That helps proteins to fold, and this is a great example. Iron helps this uh, hemoglobin protein to fold. Without iron, you can't make hemoglobin. Without e hemoglobin, you can't carry oxygen. Without oxygen, you feel tired all the time. So that's why people that are iron deficient feel tired, is because they're not making this molecule. Remember, in people with sickle cell, they have one amino acid in the amino acid chain of this uh, protein that is the wrong protein, which misfolds this molecule, which doesn't carry oxygen as well and causes the whole red blood cell to sickle. All right, this ends part four of your notes on chapter 42, animal circulation.